Today, we are exploring the built heritage of our local area, which has some fascinating buildings, including our very own museum building. We asked you what questions you had about the buildings in Western Supermare and North Somerset, and we had some great responses. We've chosen our favourites to find out more about. We chatted to Kate Hudson Macaulay, our Buildings and Heritage Officer for North Somerset, to find out the answers to these questions. So let's explore. Kerry asked what is the oldest building in Weston? Hello, I'm Kate Hudson Macaulay. I'm North Somerset Council Conservation Officer and I'm here to answer some of your wonderful questions on built heritage. To answer this first question, it's actually quite difficult it's not really clear what building in Weston is actually the oldest. It's a, there are a few contenders, but it's not, there's not one definite answer. Similarly, in most town or villages, the oldest building to survive is usually a parish church. The parish church is one of the first buildings to be built, particularly out of stone, whereas other buildings would have been made out of wood. Now, the parish church in Weston is St John's Church. This church is up by Grove Park to the west of Grove Park, and it is the oldest church in Western Mare. It was first recorded in 1226, which is the 13th century. It's thought to be even older than this, but this is the first record we actually have of the church. This church was then unfortunately demolished and rebuilt during the 15th century, but parts of this old church can still be seen today in the current building. If you've got a keen eye, you can have a look at the building. At the base of the tower, you'll see very, very large stones. This is part of that 15th century church. You can also see where the tower was raised as the church was remodelled again in 1827. And you can see the clock face. If you look really closely, you can see the old clock face. And then you can see the newer one higher up when Hans Price was the chief of the church. Much of the church that's left today is technically 19th century because Hans Price did a large remodelling of it when Western got bigger and bigger they built a, a bigger church, but there is still historic elements of the building left. This is much the same story as the other buildings in Western that are generally considered the oldest, and there's not really much evidence to say which one is definitely the oldest. You've got Leap House, which is originally the rectory for St John's Church. So this is the building that the vicar used to live in next to the church itself. It's thought to be about 300 years old. The problem is, is the building again was massively reconfigured in the 19th century. So a lot of the building was demolished, taken apart and made bigger during the 19th century. So it's really not clear how much the original 300 year old building is actually left on the site or whether or not it has all been new fabrics in the 19th century. The other house that is very much in the contention for Western Christmas oldest building is many people will know it's called the Thatch Cottage. It's along Western Seafront and it is originally built in 1774 or 1791. Again, we're not 100% sure exactly when it was built. It was built for Reverend William Leeds and it was a much bigger building when it was originally built. What's left of the cottage today is actually quite a small portion of the end building. But it again is one of the older ones in Western that you can see on the tide map if you want to know your place. But between these three buildings, it is most likely the church is the oldest, but with, it depends on how much you want to put stock in the old building fabric. Ne none of these buildings are the same as they were historically, and they've all been remodeled, but they do have the oldest history of building fabric. Alex asked, what buildings are originally behind the base of the museum building? Now, the second question regarding um, the original buildings behind Western Museum is really quite interesting. Western Museum is a, a really fantastic building. It's grade two listed and it has an absolutely wonderful history. If you do get a chance again to go and know your place and have a look at the different layers of maps, you can see how this building has kind of evolved over time. Originally, on the first map, you can see that there are cottages in this area and the gas light building had not been built yet. These cottages were then merged together to form what became the gas light building for the gas company of Western Supermare. When Western Supermare again got bigger, they needed a bigger gas 
company buildings for offices and manufacturers. So they moved it to Burlington Street, where the museum is today. Originally, these two cottages at the front of Burlington Street, called Burlington Cottages, form now the front of the museum. The cottages at the back of the street were called Westbourne Cottages, and those were now what formed the back of the museum, which was then a storeroom for the Gaslight Company. You can, if you look very closely at the building, um, building fabric of the museum internally, you can see the two Burlington Cottages at the front of the museum building and where the wall divides if you look very closely. The front of the museum, the very large, grand, classically designed elevation was actually designed by Hans Putt. He was a very famous local architect. The building facade was one of his last pieces of moon work within the Western area, and it was originally only five bays long, and it was extended to 16 bays when the gas company again got bigger, and they had to make the building bigger to accommodate more offices. One of the most interesting parts of the museum building was at the very eastern end of it, there was an old coach house. This old coach house has now been brought into the front elevation of the building and if you're lucky enough to get a tour of the museum you can still see the original coach house. This coach house was once owned by Baker's Dolphin. It was the original Baker's Dolphin depot which at the time was just a small horse and cart drawn coaches within the area and it's now become this amazing tourist bus industry from that little setup in West of Mare. But one of my most favourite things about the museum is actually the cobbled timber floor not a lot of people know the history of this timber floor, but the floor actually dates back to 1851, when the original cottage streets were laid in the area. They used cobblestones made of wood. That doesn't make much sense that cobblestones made of wood, but cobbles made of wood rather than stone were put out in front of the cottages. Now this timber floor was left in place and then reused by the gaslight company to encompass their courtyard area when they built over with the other building. And it was left there until 1913, when the building had a massively big redevelopment and they changed the layout to the building again. The cobbles were lifted and then relayed in the courtyard, which you can see today, which is now glazed over. They are the same cobbles that were laid down in 1851. This cobble floor is thought to be the last surviving example of this type of flooring in Western Supermare and it can even be the last type of this floor in the West Country itself. So to me, it's a really fascinating part of the history that not a lot of people look at. Abigail asked, why did churches use stained glass? The next question I've been asked is, um, why churches use stained glass. Stained glass has a very, very long history within our built heritage, originally being first developed in the Egyptian and Roman times. Glass is a very difficult material to manufacture and it took a lot of trial and error to get glass to remain a stable compound. And the Romans managed to achieve this. And then they began to play with adding colour to the, to the glass system to create um, colourful pieces of glass. Now, we lost the technology to make glass when the Romans withdrew from England and we didn't then learn how to make glass stable again until about the 12th century. And this stained glass was very, very small pieces. They couldn't make glass in big sheets like we do today because there wasn't the technology available to make bigger pieces. So they would patch together the small pieces of glass using lead work to create windows. They were particularly used in places such as religious buildings, not only because they, it's a very expensive material to get hold of, but because the light coming through the windows into the church almost looked godlike or otherworldly to people that were in the building. And they created this wonderful, stunning effect that made you feel in the light that there may be a presence of something natural. They were also used to pick pictures and stories of the Bible. This is because people within the 12th century generally could not read or write. They would be only people of higher class and higher status that were ever taught to read and write. The lower classes were not taught. So to understand the teachings of the Bibles, they actually used pictures 
So they would use stained glass to tell the stories of the Bible so people could understand and visualise the stories, which is why in a lot of older churches, stained glass windows featured quite shocking examples of demons and what they were assumed to be the devil as a warning for the lower class to tell the story of, you know, if you sin, you will be in trouble. So this then began to develop as stained glass developed over time and you could make bigger bits. They actually learned how to etch stained glass rather than just use colourful pieces. And they began to be able to pick things like saints and kings by carving the glass rather than just colouring it. So then you got better stories in the glass work and you start to see people more recognise the importance of the glass work. So stained glass has quite an interesting origin and it was genuinely used to create the sense of you were in somewhere special and he was telling a story to you about the building and the Bible. Thomas asked, what is a gargoyle? What is a gargoyle? Now, this question is really interesting. Gargoyles are one of the most fascinating things I think on uh, historic buildings. And uh, they often get confused with what they are and what they do. Now a gargoyle is something very specific. When you look at a building, a gargoyle is an essential part of that building's maintenance. It's not just there for purely decoration. And a lot of people get confused between what a gargoyle is and what a grotesque is, or as we call them in Somerset, hunky punk. A gargoyle is a very specific type of building carving. It's part of the church's gutter system and you will always see that there's a spout of water or spout that comes out of the gargoyle's mouth and this is what separates it from a grotesque. A grotesque or a hunter punk is just the carving of a mythical creature or um, a, a king or maybe even um, a demon, these types of things but a gargoyle specifically has a water spout coming out. And the idea is that it's part of the gutter system. So the water flows out of to stop the water running down the sides of the church and destroying the stonework. It throws it away from the building, stop water ingress through the stone. It's called a gargoyle. I think that some people may know or may guess. It comes from the, the French word gargoyle. And it, in English, it means throat or gullet. So it means that the carving of the monster is gargling with the water. So the water is then coming out of its mouth and it's gargling, so it's a gargoyle. They are usually always, on older churches, they tend to be uh, or monsters. So they, they serve really another thing, much like stained glass windows. They're there to be monsters to scare away evil spirits or the devil, devil from being able to enter the church. So they would, gargoyles and grotesques were there to kind of protect the church from evil spirits or evil doers from getting into the sacred space. So I think, like most things on churches, they are highly decorative, but they are very highly functional and they're really important to what, keeping those buildings safe from deterioration. Rowan asked, how did they build big buildings and church towers so tall in the past? With the making of tall buildings or large buildings, I'm going to ask you guys a question. And have you ever wondered when you look at old historic buildings or ruins, why there are small holes in the walls of old buildings? They're not big enough to be a window, but they're very small square holes, almost as if the stonemason sort of kind of forgot to put a stone in. These are actually called plug holes, and they're part of the construction of historic buildings. Basically, tall buildings historically were generally built similarly to buildings how we do it today. They're built using scaffolding. But this scaffolding in historic times was made of timber and they would actually plug into the side of the walls as the building built up. They would leave a piece of stone out, plug in the timber and build like a rack out of timber so you could stand on them and then build a staircase up. So it was then built into the side of these buildings. And that's how they would go up the building with these plug holes. 
So when you see old buildings and old ruins, you can sometimes see these plug holes left in the building. They'd also use cranes. Admittedly, they're not as big cranes you get today. They were wooden cranes. They would then lift up through the building as they went layer by layer up you went. And these cranes were made of wood and they had almost, as the best way you can really describe it, is a hamster wheel, but for people. So people would stand inside the hamster wheel and they would pull the wheel over and this would then hoist the crane up to the small part of the building. And this is generally how they would build smaller buildings. It's not quite as magical as people think, but it is a very, very clever way of using technology, quite similar to what we use today. It just was all people powered and generally made of um, timber. We want to say a big thank you to Kate for chatting to us today. We hope you like this Ask the Museum video. There are many others to watch on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to learn more about the fun side of history, just follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Or to find out more about Western Museum, including our learning and events programme, just head to our website, www.westernmuseum.org.